things to talk about today. And I do want to give thanks and praises for being here. I do want to let you know how much I love you because as I look at each and every one of you, I'm seeing myself, uh, which is, uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. Which is um, a really an humbling and uh, very uh, gracious experience for me. So um, I want you all to feel at home as I talk about the, some things that I want to share with you today. Okay, good. And uh, if there are concepts or ideas, et cetera, that you're not able to understand as I have expressed them, okay, if you would just please make sure you bring that to my attention and I can focus in on what I need to say or reword it so that it clicks in for you. Because we're going to talk about some very, very important uh, concepts today that I'm real concerned about that you understand so that you can apply this in your life in your own special way about how you can make things uh, transform. Because this is what we're really talking about, transformative information so that you can move through to the next stage of your own evolution. Um, I was looking at our flyer here and there's some basic things that I do want to say on that. I'm kind of like uh, Reverend Ike. He makes a statement that, you know, he never lets the topic uh, of his discussion interfere with what he has to say. You know, but I definitely want to make sure that what's on our agenda here, I do want to address. So I learned a long time ago because of where my information comes from that I don't write formal uh, presentations. Okay, uh, interesting enough, I channel a lot of information. And uh, as I was meditating on what was my directives for how I was to speak to you today, it came to me that the first thing that we need to get clear on is understanding the anatomy of being a human being as we understand ourselves at this moment, and then how that works through the structure of the mind. It's real important. And then from there, understanding the dis-ease processes that we're going to talk about, prostate disease, uterine fibroid disease, perhaps even cancer, if we have time to get to that today. You can clearly understand what is the real issue in these diseases so that you can begin to put them in perspective. Because so many of us are uh, committing truly universal sins, okay? And when I talk about sins, I'm saying that we, for whatever reason, are not mastering the lesson. That's my definition of what a sin is, is that you're not mastering the lesson like continuous failure, that uh, we are seeing circumstances that we create for ourselves as something that we have no control over and that really perhaps are punitive measures or a whole bunch of other things that really are not the real issue at all. So when we can begin to grasp and understand that the circumstances that we find ourselves in are always blessings, that are always opportunities to enlightenment and most of all a question to ask us if we're now ready to move into our God and Godship initiations, then we are always able to keep things into perspective and work through them. So diseases, as most of us are aware of, seem to be something that most people are devastated by, that they are not understanding that these also are pre-initiations or actual initiations into taking one's power and allowing the divinity that's within them to basically take over and move them through the rest of their life on the planet. So many of us assign a lot of definitions and lock onto a lot of belief systems around the dysfunction that we created in our physical bodies that again take us off into a whole different lifestyle that was never ever the intention for us to experience. So when you can begin to understand how you are functioning in this dimension as a modality, then the dis that you might have or have had in the past that you are still being asked to master because surgery is only palliative. It is not ever corrective. And that's very important to understand. So if you've been post-surgical patients for whatever reason, even if it's been because you needed valves reconstructed or whatever else, et cetera, the dis-ease entity is still there and being asked to master. So there's a lot of still stuff that's lurking in our, what I call, other subtle bodies that we still have to clear out, which is why we still have this discontentment and a lot of other things that are on this dimension. So if I can just move to my um, overhead here and we can start doing some work on understanding what's happening with the mind, then I think we can move on. I'm, I'm, am I on here? Okay. And I think you'll also be able to see too the importance of uh, 
how melanin is really going to be operating. Okay. So you don't have to see my back after all. <laughs> okay. I don't know if there's such a word at, named, known as humanism, but for right now, we're going to create it. Okay. And this is a existence that all of us have selected. Forms are long. So. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, Alzheimer's is a reflection of an individual that basically does not want to take responsibility for the quality of their life. So they just shut down the, the uh, mainframe computer. That's what that is. So that's the spiritual manifestation of that disease. So that means that there's a state of consciousness and the lifestyle that these people live that make that a physical reality, okay? Because it truly is a lack of circulation and oxygenation to the brain, which shuts it down, okay? So it's not coincidental that they have this hardening of the arteries or microvascular occlusion, as we call it, to the cerebral arteries, because it could have been in their big toe. Well, why not the big toe? Well, why not the finger? or whatever else. I mean, but it's like when you really look at their whole perception of what they think about the quality of their life, they're like, oh, I'm out of here. Just take care of me. And we don't want to have to figure out no more problems. Yes? No. Uh, we mentioned in meditation, and in that life, uh, when one is in a deeper state of Huh? Has there been research indicating that um, also regenerate the melanin when one is in a deeper state of consciousness? Um, Hmm. Well, I'm sure there has. You know, what just comes to my mind is, for in fact, I've dealt with some people that have had vitiligo, you know, which is a disease where the melanocytes die. And, you know, when we deal with some of their real issues around their ambivalences, around feeling that, you know, having been pigmented was an issue for their lack of success or whatever else, et cetera, and they can come to grips with the fact that, you know, whatever they did or did not do really had nothing to do with their melanin, then these lesions stop growing and they begin to fill in. The reason I say that is because um, um, in meditative states, particularly if one knows how, which is um, activate the different chakras. The Sasakara chakra, which is represented as the female plane, on a day with the activate them, it stands for me that one would be able to also produce some, uh, some forms of melanin. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. You know, I'm, I'm sure question about that. I mean, you, you do that automatically. It's an automatic process at nighttime, you know, if you would just make sure that you have minimal light going to the brain, to the eye, you know, but I'm sure that, you know, you can do this anytime. But I'm just saying on a subconscious level, when I think of people that have vitiligo, you know, when you really sit down and talk with them, they have real issues about feeling that, you know, their state of pigmentation has been some real issues as far as their success and endeavors, you know, and I think Michael Jackson is a real good example of that. Okay, and then when they come to grips with the fact that recognizing that, you know, that's really not the issue and just move on with living, et cetera, that these lesions stop spreading, you know. No, that they are. <laughs> uh, well, they are all uh, manifestations of universal law but they just have different activities in this dimension. Okay, so there's just a whole teaching on that. Some people call it geomancy, cien sui, just a lot of, depending on the culture you read. Okay. But Pythagoras basically understood this. As I said, he got wired up in Egypt. And so when he came back to Rome, he uh, then began to really understand what he was dealing with mathematically and began his own mystery schools where this was actually a requirement that they actually focus on and actually become these geometric forms so that 
their whole level of thought and thinking actually became realigned so that they could begin to see on the moment that whatever they thought or imaged precipitated. See, so it's like, it's like the first steps in becoming a, booty, a bodhisattva. See, because the more you're in alignment with the laws that govern this dimension, whatever your mind focuses on, immediately it precipitates. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And most people don't realize that that's the law that is happening in their lives all the time, but if they are not able to connect and identify time in space when they thought these thoughts and then actually see the results, I think well, most people forget because they're not even aware that th thoughts are things and that as this stuff is going through their mind that they really are magnetizing it to them at some time in their life. That's why it's so important that certain thoughts you can't allow yourself to entertain because once you entertain it, it's a promise and it'll be your reality unless you know how to neutralize that. So, I mean, that was like really heavy when I woke up to the fact that I had to be responsible for every thought. I was like, woo! I was like, whoa, this is incredible, you know? So, I mean, I had to really get real clear then on how to use this brain and this mind body. I had to get real clear here on, you know, how do we stay focused on, you know, not allowing this thing to just go off and just generate all kind of thoughts, et cetera, that I'm going to have to deal with. And that's when you really begin to understand the need to know universal laws and actually see your whole self and your life through that. Okay, and that automatically uh, keeps you very focused here on being responsible and knowing how to handle what you're going to create. Okay, just real quickly, uterine fibroids and prostate disease. Okay, so this is a uter little uterus cut on its side here. And this is a prostate, okay, and as you know, the uh, prostate gland is an undeveloped uterus, okay, exact same organ and tissue, except one has actually gone on to its full development where the prostate has stayed in an undeveloped state. Oh, okay. And so, therefore, if you don't eat it and it's fertile and you just let it sit there, okay, you will see the actual fruit shrivel up because the endometrium or the meat of the fruit is actually being used as nutrients for the seeds, okay, and you'll then see the seeds in there get bigger. Depending on the type of fruit, if you open it up, you'll actually see a little umbilical cord, which is a root, we call it in the plant, sticking out of the seeds, okay, and then normally, if that fruit falls to the ground, the little root will dig itself in the earth and just go on and continue to grow. Okay, what's well, the same process that human beings go through? <laughs> okay, so uh, it was interesting when it was finally introduced to me that thoughts are like seeds. Okay, and the mind functions like a uterus. So that whatever thoughts we actually impregnate our mind body with, the mind body actually will nurture that until it actually is able to motivate the physical body to do or say whatever that seed thought contains to become a reality in our outer world, exactly what the uterus does. Okay. Now when we have people who do not want to honor how their uterus functions or be responsible for what it is that the uterus will nurture, we start getting into problems. And what I discovered in uh, relationship to uterine fibroids is that when I looked at these women, you know, just about 100% of them, so I'll just make that 99% of them, have ambivalences about having children, definitely have had uh, male-female relationship problems, or usually have ambivalences about who they would have children with, definitely have uh, issues that are not clear 
as to the relationship that having children would have in their lives relative to a value system that they've taken on as something that they want to actualize. <coughs> and so again, genetically, when we look at uterine fibroids, and we look at, again, the information that's in the genes, whatever the cultural value system is that is handed down to you genetically, and the cultural value system that your ancestors have lived, and also the cultural value system that your um, peers are living, actually will, as we said, turn on your genes to stimulate you to spontaneously want to carry out the same behavior. Okay. And so it's been interesting because here in America, the Europeans have a different value system around children, how you're supposed to function sexually, what a capable mate is. All these different things have a different definition than what we've accepted in Africa. For example, you know, in Africa, the children are the most valuable thing or valuable asset that we have. It's not gold or diamonds or how many houses we have, etc. <coughs> not true in America, you know. Wealth in America is defined by how much of a particular materialistic object you're able to collect, okay, and demonstrate, okay. Relationships in Africa are something that are considered very special, and a real special person in Africa is one who has the capacity to have the win the hearts and respect of others, okay. Relationships in Eurocentric uh, axiology is a means to an end, okay? It is the capacity that one gives to acquire materialistic things or an object of importance, okay? But the real value in that being able to relate to you, etc., just for the aesthetics of being with you is not important Eurocentrically, okay? I beg your pardon? No problem. Okay. Sexuality. Uh, in Africa, tradition was actually a way of demonstrating one's love and affection and a willingness to truly share themselves. Okay. And also was taught as a sacred act because it was, at least the woman's body looked at as a gateway of being able to actualize divine awareness or know the creator. Okay. Uh, Eurocentrically, it's confusing. Okay. <laughs> it's real confusing what sexuality is. Okay. I haven't been able to get real clear on that yet. And I, obviously it's because they're not. Okay, they're real confused on that. Okay, and so I have not been able to really discern what they're saying. Okay, so, you know, the denial of one's gender, okay, the uh, unwillingness to want to relate to oneself uh, as a male or female or female male, you know, as I said, interaction, sexual activity with animals, children, I mean, all of that, I don't know what that is. All I know is that it's something that is not innately uh, choices, okay, that we made naturally at home in Africa, okay. And so just looking at all of these other alternatives that have been offered to us uh, sets up confusion okay, in our uh, physical chemistry, okay, because it's something that the genes are really not very clear on as to what it does and how it actually interacts and what we know as an axiology. So, when an individual feels that there's a certain part of their body that is going to bring them problems based on a value system that they do or do not want to honor, then that part of the body is actually now brought under chemical attack, okay? And so therefore, the value systems of women with uterine fibroids or men with prostate disease actually create a chemistry neurologically just from their consciousness and the thoughts that they're having 
that is alien to the genetic memory that already lies within these organs. And there actually ensues a chemical war in the body that is manifested by this distortion in tissue, which eventually causes a distortion in function. So what we have found is that when we're able to offer the African man and woman the information on how the mind works, to review with them their genetic value system, to review with them the value system that they are now influenced by, and then allow them to make a choice, okay? The willingness for them to make a choice in the consciousness of knowing what both value systems offer or what they perceive could be the results of creates a neurochemistry that is neutral. It creates a buffer system that actually allows the uterus and the prostate to resolve its chemical conflict because it's no longer under attack from the neurotransmitters made by the brain that actually allows it to move back into a normal state of functioning. So it's, so it's very interesting that prostate disease, uterine fibroid disease is an attempt of an individual to actualize a foreign value system around obviously their sexuality and their creative capacity without creating a buffer system to merge into that new awareness. Because, see, I'm not saying that you can't move into a foreign value system and culture. You can. But there has to be a conscious buffer system that you choose to use to move into that because the genes are constantly functioning at one level unless you then reprogram them to function at another. You just cannot jump from one thing to another when it has been something that has been handed down for a long period of time. There has to be a buffer system that has to be created. And we as Africans in America have not created that for ourselves. Okay. Now, my own conclusion is, is that the only uh, buffer system that we should be using and the only axiology that we should be moving in is one that's based on universal law, which was the original axiology that we lived in many, many years ago when we were at harmony with ourselves when we were in Africa. And we have to really discover what that is. Okay, because, you know, as I see ourselves rejecting our creativity, feeling that, you know, uh, men are not us as women and as women feeling that men are not us, and having antagonism against ourselves is definitely bringing about destruction, okay? Because it's really interesting, you know, in the, in the, how can I say, in the other dimension, there's no such thing really as male or female, okay? But this delineation in gender is actually a lesson truly in understanding how electricity and how magnetism works in a magnetic field. Because truly, left and right brain always function together, and that's what male and female really represent. And so being able to work with the outer manifestation of your right brain or left brain is really a lesson in actually learning how to work with yourself. And so, you know, there's really no option here of people thinking that they can't, they, they don't have to work with the opposite sex or that they can't work with the opposite sex or that this is some alien thing. You know, and it's really interesting when I hear women say that about men because no man gets here unless it comes to a woman's body. So, you know, when I hear men, women talk about men like there's some entity that was just dropped out of, out of space. And I'm like, well, where do they think they've been? I mean, because, you know, every, all men have a mother. They came through them. And so it was like, well, what were you thinking about? Or what was your mother thinking about when she was carrying them? And what was she raising them with? What values or whatever? Because by no means should something that comes through you be alien to you. Okay. So it's really interesting when, you know, women, I, you know, it's amazing. I, I'm just trying to figure out what was going on here. When we have, you know, I mean, in some countries, you know, men are setting women on fire. I need a new wife. So you get doused with gasoline and get set on fire. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> I can't even believe that. So it's like, well, what has really happened 
is this big schism in your own consciousness that somebody would actually set their own selves on fire? I mean, because that's what you're literally doing. I mean, so, you know, how can you disrespect this person that is actually your other self? You know what I mean? And it's like, obviously, when we forget who we are, it's real easy. But that's the whole point, is that it doesn't go away, and we still are held accountable. So you can't forget. So these are what I consider very interesting and intriguing exercises that we are here on Earth to master. Okay? And, you know, refraining from wanting to deal with yourself, which is what Europeans call the opposite sex, you know, is not an option. It really is not an option. So, again, uterine fibroids, prostate disease is a psychosocial, psychosexual disorder where these individuals are attempting to amalgamate into a form belief system without consciously creating a buffer system through which they are going to work through. And not until they do that, they are going to actually bring about their own destruction of their own reproductive organs, which again requires us to take some responsibility and decide for ourselves what it is we want and how we want to handle our own self sexually and reevaluate what our definition is on our relationships and our children and move from there. So this is another disease that's asking us to reestablish our own ethnology and our own culture. Okay. And so, you know, so you know, whether it starts out as sexually transmitted diseases or all this other stuff, you know, it's it's all dealing around the same issue of not really knowing what to do with ourselves sexually, how to function, how not to function, etc. And as I talk to women of older peer groups, I mean, it's been incredible the amount of information and the amount of ignorance that's been handed down about sexual behavior, function of the body, etc. I mean, it's really almost like talking to people in the dark ages. You know, so it's been incredible. We, we have to get in contact with ourselves as to why we have so many limitations and so many distortions and uh, so uncomfortable about talking about ourselves. I mean, because that's what we're actually talking about. Okay, like it's going to, you know, disappear because we don't talk about it. It's not going to be a problem. No, no, no. So I think that that is basically just about it. You know, this has been a very interesting lecture for me because I had no intention of telling you all about these different things. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, I was asked to do so and the stuff just came down. So I'm assuming that everyone here was able to basically get what they needed. So I do want to take some time for just a few questions to summarize some things up. And uh, then at that point, I would like to say thank you and good night. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you have to be of a higher or lower vibratory rate? Yeah, a higher or a lower, I guess, than normal in order to see outside of what's considered visual spectrum. Right. Yes. That's what TVs and radios and telephones do. Right. They actually are able to uh, receive light that is traveling at a different speed. Mm -hmm. So therefore you would have to either slow down yourself or increase yourself to be able to perceive this. And the African has the capacity to move at all these different speeds. So depending upon what you're thinking, which is actually what is the speedometer, of the rate of your vibratory rate, your conscious mind will determine what your reality is at the moment. Okay, and because you have melanin that captures that for you, you can be in any of these places. All you have to do is think it. So it's real different because Europeans can perceive and think it, but again, they have to create it outside of themselves and reflect it back to them that they're really there. That's why it's so devastating when you begin to talk with them about being there and they have no way of knowing that they're there. Because then their question to you is, how do you just do that? And if you've ever talked to them, when you bring them up to that point, that you're moving them out of the visual spectrum, they'll be like, oh no, how do you just do that? Because to them, it's like jumping off the end of the world. So you can truly understand how they could have understood that the world was flat. Because unless they have some support, that actually can reflect to them that there is something else out there beyond what they can intuitively perceive, they're not going to go 
The thing is that, oh no, but, <laughs> sorry, but that is not my reality and we just have to stay in pain. Okay? And you know, it's very few of them that are willing to basically just say, well, you know, I don't know what's out there, but I'm just going. You know, the Columbuses, or, it's rare that they go out there, but then those are the ones that say, oh yeah, look, and this is what I brought back. <laughs> but they're not into that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and what you're describing is really uh, the practice of Tantra, okay, the Tantra Yoga, which is actually finally being able to move through uh, satisfying the needs of sexual activity on the physical level, and moving through the, excuse me, through the different gateways, okay, into the different levels of your other subtle bodies for awareness, okay. Now the key here is, is that because, as they say, your sacred cauldrons, okay, have uh, scars on them, okay, because these are also chakra points too, you know, that have been traumatized by this kind of surgery, your husband, you and your husband, you know, there's some processes that you can put yourself and he can put himself through uh, to ensure that on the emotional, mental level, that you've learned the lessons here that this was asked of you. Okay, and then you can then proceed on to begin to use this energy sexually that you create, that generate, to help yourself regenerate your physical organ there. Okay, because one of the most powerful healing tools is what I call conscious sexual practices. You know, and these are real, real old positions and rhythms and state of consciousness that actually regenerate physical tissue. It's actually the fastest way of healing in a partnership. Okay. Right, well there's quite a few books out on this now. They even have, you know, just magazines that come out every month that just deal with all of this. Okay, because obviously uh, sexuality, as most people know it, has hit rock bottom. I mean, you know, so so it can only go up. I mean, it can't it can't get any more bizarre at this point. So we can just only go into a higher extreme, okay? And so you know, it's really interesting how balance uh, nature is always balancing herself out. So it's not hard at all to begin to get these kind of teachings, okay? So any decent bookstore, there's Mantachia, there's um, uh, Sanyata Saraswati, okay? His books. 
Uh, you know, I, matter of fact, I probably have about 40 or 50 books on nothing but just sex and tantra. Okay, that, you know, I'm just looking at and reading information from. So you can get a lot of answers. All you have to do is just be willing to invest in the knowledge, okay? What kind of thing, how do you get over that ambivalence that you were referring to uh, causing problems? Okay, well, you know, normally this stuff has been imprinting from childhood, okay? It's just like, for example, you know, the whole tradition in uh, African women in America is really one of doom and gloom when a uh, female child now moves into a physiologic womanhood. And so instead of that being a wonderful celebration, you know, when uh, a young woman starts her period, etc., you know, most women are sitting up, you know, wringing their hands about, I hope she don't bring a baby in here, and just a whole bunch of other stuff, or they're just real pissed off that, you know, now they got somebody else that they got to be concerned about whether they're going to have some type of adverse effect on their life. Okay, I mean, that's just the whole attitude instead of really a celebration into welcoming this younger person into a new level of awareness with new responsibility and new freedoms, etc. You understand what I'm saying? So you have to understand that these are all of the uh, indoctrinations that you're going to have to basically release that your parents and ancestors, etc., have put upon you so that then you can open yourself up to decide, again, this buffer system as to how you want to redefine yourself and look at it, okay? But I'm saying, first of all, we have to give up the need that, you know, having periods is something dirty and that, you know, this is an issue and, you know, men are no good, whatever all that stuff is is passed on to you. You know, African women, to me, are extremely attractive, you know, and, you know, the whole idea that they've been uh, castrated, uh, by their parents, you know, their breast is too big and your butt is this and just a whole bunch of other stuff, you know. See, all of that stuff uh, gives you some very serious self-esteem issues, okay, and especially if, you know, the uh, uh, beauty standards of an other, another race has been upheld in your family, I mean, it's totally castrated, okay, because there's no way in this dimension that you will ever be able to live up to that. Okay, so it's like really interesting that, you know, many African women reach out for an illusion that they can never be, okay, without creating some severe pathology, okay, and I, I just find that just really intriguing, but these are all the things you have to give up, and this is my personal opinion, you know, and I'm just waiting to see this to be proven, truly this is my personal opinion now, we're going to talk about science data, okay, what I've concluded is, is that if these are the experiences that have been passed down to you, this lifetime, this is because this is how you treated others in the past. So you have to understand that it's really not the mother or the aunt or the father, or whatever. These are actions that you committed to others, and because everything returns back to a source, you're on the reciprocating end. And the past, or past life. Past life, okay. So therefore, you're here now to experience how this feels to basically have done this to other people, and when you can move to that level and forgive yourself, see, this is the whole issue. All you have to do is be able to move to the level that you're forgiving yourself, then that's when you totally open up the gateways and all of this karma becomes dharma now and you can move on. But see, when people continue to want to sit up and whine and cry about what their mama did and their daddy did and a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, they're totally missing the point because this is a mirror. You know, so if you got a drunken daddy and you got a real bold mama and a whole bunch of other stuff, then you see in yourself. Mm -hmm. This is how you was dealing before. Mm -hmm. And this is how those folks that had to deal with you felt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you can get to that, then you can understand here that you can you gotta make some real decisions that you will never be cavalier, okay, be disrespectful, a whole bunch of other things ever again to other people because you understand that this is really, really some, some severe discomfort and you're willing to let that go. And see, when you're able to get to that point, then you'll see that overnight their whole stuff changes. It's miraculous because, again, this is the law of mirror effect. So it's very difficult for most people to want to accept the fact that what they're experiencing in life is their own creation. I mean, you can, you can just get loaded with that mess on these talk shows now. Everybody sits there whining and crying about what somebody did to me and the man was this and the mama was that and the uncle was a whole bunch of other stuff, you know. And I'm sure all of that stuff is very true. But see, all you're seeing is what you were. 
and these are the consequences. Now can you get to that and make some decisions about not being that anymore and move on? And when you can move to that level of healing, then this is where you are. This is why I caution my patients intensely about not taking the dis-ease and dysfunction in their body lightly. Because if they make the mistake of debilitating the tissues to such an extent that they cannot be held any longer in this dimension through the physical body, and they experience the dis-ease phenomenon known as death, they got to come back and deal with that. My thing is that hell, who wants to have cancer, diabetes, or high blood pressure, all that stuff over and over and over again? That's why it's no treatment for it. It'll never be one, because it is a state of consciousness. And it's issues that you are not dealing with here. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, if you're going to get healed, this is the best time. You know, it's like you better run with it quick, you know, and get all your stuff in order so that you can move on. Because I'm telling you is that, you know, this idea that you're going to get some kind of relief or freedom from death, it's ridiculous. It's not true because you can never run away from yourself. Anybody that does astral traveling or has had out-of-body experiences knows that everything that you know is right there with you. Okay, these are states of consciousness, yes. Two things. I want you to know, I get around a bit, but this is the most profound teaching that I have ever experienced, and I really appreciate it, and I want more of it. So I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a group in this area who wants to form to study what you've been teaching us, would you be available somehow to guide us? <laughs> See, I don't know that. All I know is, is um, the fact that, you know, my instructions are to leave support groups. Okay, and I've, I'll make the announcement again that tomorrow morning we are inviting those women who are willing now to make a commitment to themselves to come together and to work out their uh, long life issues that they can meet us here at 9.30 in the morning to start forming their own support group here. Okay. The other, the other question is, what what are you what kind of buffer do you have to protect yourself from the EMA? What kind of buffer do I have? Yeah. To check protect yourself from the EMA. Truth. That's 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 just the problem. Well no, I mean that's it. I mean, you know, the truth will always set you free. I mean I'm not bound by the AMA. Okay. Because you have to understand that my practice is no longer invasive. I mean, there's no need for me to ever touch an individual ever again to be able to treat them and help them to heal because the tools and things that basically I use, et cetera, uh, do not even move up into that realm anymore. But I'm sure you know that those are the kind of people they go after to put you out of business. You know that. Yeah, you know, see, I, I hear what you're saying, but the key of it is, is that I can only be who I am and I can only do what I was created to do. And see, I want you to say that. Yeah, but see, you have to understand this, is that when you understand that when you're truly on purpose, you have divine protection. Okay, and so my thing is that I don't, you know, I'm sure there's some spies in here, you know, from the AMA that's going to be running back or whatever they're doing, et cetera, and clicking pictures and whatever else, et cetera. But see, the universe knows everybody's weakness. And so my thing is, is that, you know, if they think that they can actually interfere with uh, people who truly have asked for their higher good, it's impossible. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, and, 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 and I hear you clearly, and I do want to say this, is that truly when I was instructed that this was what I was supposed to do to go out and say these things and share with people, etc., I mean, I was like devastated. I'm like, you're crazy. I'm not saying I'm just nobody. It's like, you know, I have my little library at home and I just read and study and I'm just keeping this to myself. You know, and my little voice inside was like, sorry, but you're supposed to be out here doing this. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. And I remember my first real public appearance when I appeared on one of the uh, national TV shows uh, in Detroit. It used to be known as PM Magazine. And they wanted me to uh, talk to them about my medical astrology, okay, and to let them interview some patients and that kind of thing. I mean, I told those people no, and I slammed the phone down because my whole practice has always been built by word of mouth for just this reason. And, you know, little voice is like, sorry, you know, but you, you, you're going to have to start doing this work, you know. And so they kept calling me back, you know. And so I said, okay, fine, you know, you can come out. So I chose some patients they could interview, that kind of thing. 
And I still was very, very, very reluctant to do this, you know. And as a matter of fact, I was like a whole hour late, you know. They had the cameras in, a whole bunch of other stuff. And I just really must have cried all night about this because I had some real issues because I saw this really being real devastating as far as my career. So I realized at that point in time that I was going to have to get some real clarity to be able to proceed on in doing this kind of work. Okay, and so my thing is that because you know I'm I'm looking at Malcolm X dead as a doornail, Martin Luther King dead, Marcus Garvey in jail. No matter what they're doing to him, you know all these kind of things. I'm like, now who wants to join that? I'm not interested in anything like that, you know. So I said, okay, what have I learned from NLP, neuro linguistic programming? Okay, it's very simple. NLP says that there are three things that you have to do. First of all, if you want to accomplish anything, you have to, first of all, understand the belief system of the individuals who have accomplished what you want to do, okay? Then secondly, you have to watch how they do that. And then thirdly, all you have to do is put your body through the paces and you'll get exactly the same results. So my thing is that I didn't want their results. So that meant that I need to understand what their belief system was so that I could weed out what I didn't want to believe to get the same results. You understand what I'm saying? Secondly, then I had to clearly understand what did they do, okay, so that I basically would not put myself in that same position because I didn't want their results. So that I could basically know that I could do what I needed to do and move on. You're going to be all right. So, do you understand what I'm saying? So when I basically went into some meditations and started talking with these folks and reading their work and, you know, looking back at some old videos and things of them, you know, it was, became quite obvious as to how they all declared what they had because they all abdicated and, first of all, believed in what? Sacrifice. Okay, the universe says that sacrifice is never necessary because abundance is a natural state of affairs. So I don't have to give up my life for anybody. And I don't have to give up my profession for anybody. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Secondly, my right as a physician is because it is by divine right. There has basically been no man that has bestowed this upon me. What I am telling you today has not been taught to me in any medical school. This has nothing to do with the AMA and what I was taught at Creighton University. You understand what I'm saying? So my degree, first of all, is divinely given, and obviously they cannot take it if they don't understand what it is to take. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? So, I mean, so the AMA has nothing to do with this. Okay, now, I'm basically just collecting their data for whatever reason they're not willing to teach it and to reveal it and sharing it with you. You know, this is in any medical library. As I said in my books, I have all of these references there. This stuff comes out of University of Michigan. It comes out of MIT. It comes out of the National Institute of Health, etc. Now, they have to explain to you because I've told you that they've had it, why they haven't told you. So it's a their problem now, it's not mine. Do you understand what I'm saying? They have to now be accountable that they know that you've always been different and they've refused to acknowledge that and have judged you by somebody else's standards. So they have to be accountable for that, not me. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when I finally got real clear that I did not have to give up my life to be able to help other folks, which is a real pseudo-Christian belief, Okay, which is a real pseudo-Christian belief. It's a false doctrine that I don't know how it's being taught around here, but it's a heavy thing that's going around here in people who are Christian. Okay, that is not true, that you do not have to basically give up your life to be able to help other folks. And especially if you're a Christian, because J.C. supposedly said that I'm going to give up mine, so nobody else has to give up theirs. So then that means that this ended with him. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm saying? So therefore, when people still walk around here with crucifixes around their neck and stuff, they miss the teaching. Okay, because it's not about death anymore because that's over. I'm the first and the last. So I'm like, now if we're going to talk about using this stuff, then now let's use it correctly as it's actually been written. Okay? So I'm just saying that I hear you clearly and I looked at all that seriously because truly, as far as I'm concerned, those people definitely allow themselves to set up examples that for younger people definitely would make them freeze and want to say anything about anything that could be contrary to the system. Okay, my thing is that I'm interested in all human beings having a high quality of life. Okay, so my practice is basically I I basically treat everybody. 
I have Oriental, Caucasian, African patients, etc. And I had to basically go and study to be able to handle them. Okay, because my thing is if I don't understand your ethnicity and your genes, I'm the first one to tell you, I don't think I can help you and send you away because I don't need to take your money because the universe takes care of me. Okay, so therefore my true practice is first do no harm. So I'm not interested in, you know, just telling me some stuff that I truly can identify does not apply to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So uh, it's time now that we have to understand that we do have a higher force that basically will neutralize any entity, okay, that would actually interrupt the good for all, okay, and that we don't have to have an arsenal, I do not have to have satellites in outer space, a star, war system, and a whole bunch of other things to deal with that, because just like all that stuff got out of there, up there, it was even endowed to them by the same power that's supporting me, which obviously can utilize it for their own worst good, okay, if they want to misdirect it. So you teach others how to use that power? Of course. Okay, because the key of it is, is that all I do is practice universal principles. And if you align yourself with the laws that govern the universe, they automatically are going to protect you. Do you understand that? Right. And that's it's just very simple. And that's where we have actually fallen out of alignment and that's why we have Caucasians that have become so paranoid, okay, that they basically have to have guns and all this stuff, you know, at every corner because they align themselves with universal truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This gentleman, though. Yes, doctor. Is your speaking well, it is more so on scientific data. I think, again, uh, Fred Allen Wolf is a wonderful person to uh, read. He's an integral physicist and has done a lot of expression of this in mathematical terms. But also, too, just from my own personal experiences. Okay, now, you know, as I said, I can't speak for other people per se, but I have had and I do have activated, okay, extrasensory perceptive skills, okay, that have allowed me to be able to experience and see things that most people have not saw or experienced, okay. As a matter of fact, uh, it was so interesting that not until I was 15 years old uh, did I begin to even get comfortable with the fact that you know, a lot of stuff I was seeing just was not of my own imagination when I was able to find my way to the first medical bookstore and find buy my first book on chakras, you know, because I'm seeing all this stuff on people and I'm like, ah, nobody's talking about this, you know, I must be crazy. No, we just won't discuss it. You know, I mean, I was, it was very disturbing. So it's like my own inner hell that I was living in because of my perception being something that I definitely, for whatever reason, did not discuss with others, but I had to live through. So when I was able to just start going to the metaphysical bookstores and buying books that other people are like seeing these things, okay, and we're drawing pictures of them, I was like, oh, good, you know what I mean, et cetera. And so, I mean, that was actually my uh, comfort zone was just reading about other people's experiences and what they were perceiving because it just let me know that I just was not crazy and that these experiences that I, were have, I was having and my perceptions were not because of a psychological imbalance and it was just a activation, okay, of my nervous system that resonated at a different rate than most people, okay. I mean, and not until just very recently did I even share with my mother, okay, a lot of the things that I just used to experience and had to deal with as a child, okay. So I do not see uh, these uh, sensitivities that I have as uh, extrasensory. Okay, I really see them as just probably tools that were necessary for me to have to do my work, but that they are tools that everybody has, but there has to be, for most people, an awareness to want to honor them. Because there's a lot of people now that I've talked to that have, that have extra sensory perceptive capacities, but usually they have not wanted to deal with them or they had to put them in a real fantastic sense because they just did not get any support on how to amalgamate it into your everyday life. You know, I mean, it's like really interesting because I mean, many times in college, I remember, you know, just sitting in the back of the auditorium, you know, and the whole auditorium for me was lit up, even though it was dark, 
because, you know, there were transparencies on the screen, you know, because I'm looking at everybody's aura and everybody's, you know, etheric body, you know, so it's all these shadows and things. And I'm like, wow, this is deep. I wonder who's, you know, who's seeing like this. And you just start actually just ignoring it and see, seeing through it because you just have to stay real focused. You know what I mean? So um, the best thing I can tell you is that, you know, it was relieving for... Uh, this information to come through being written and also being able to be expressed through mathematical terms. But my enlightenment and awareness of it came first, okay, and that's what I found was real uh, devastating and trying for me because uh, that was my whole thing about, you know, needing to be accepted because nobody else is knowing this, nobody else is talking about this, you know, and you just can't like run out in the street and just start saying these things, so what do you do with it? And that's when I began to have uh, health problems, significant health problems, in recognizing the need for me to stop questioning so much and doubting and just be. Okay, so I had to really start accepting just being myself and staying in the present. Okay, and that was the greatest teaching of my own cancer because, you know, cancer patients are liars. This is a disease for liars. Okay, because these are people who definitely have resentment, angers, ambivalences about the quality of life that they're leading, the things that they're doing, but they're not honest enough to just say, we ain't doing it, or I want to do something else, etc. I mean, so they live a whole life of a lie and then got the nerve to get pissed off about it. Okay, and so it's like really coming to a whole realization of actually being able to say no or to say yes or to be just who you are and let the cards fall where they may because these people are into a real need of acceptance. And so, you know, even in my residency, you know, I just had to just start tuning down just more and more and more myself because, you know, I would come to me what was wrong with people. You know, I have a little voice and it was like, yeah, this person's liver is like really off, you know, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, we up here on the adrenal glands, you know, <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, you know, shut up, be quiet, there's nothing I can do about this, you know, because I'm like the little peon resident, right, you know, and they up here doing biopsies and just a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, and, you know, and it's coming to me that they have some significant liver ailments and some other things, and it's like, well, what do you do? Because you cannot take the chart and write orders and talk about you're going to do this test and that test and do this other because you're going to get weaned out by the staff person, right? So it's like, well, what do you do? And I just had to really stop listening to myself. You know, I had to really stop seeing, et cetera. And then I had this choice. It's like, you're going to see and you're going to hear or you're going to be out of here. Now, what are you going to do? Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, I think we in our own ways have these testimonies, you know, and I just really ask people, you know, not to have to create so much drama in their life, okay, before they allow themselves to really, you know, be real, okay. And this is really a test now that everybody's going to have to really come real with themselves, okay, or it's going to be just a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort, okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. There's a lot of books now on meditation for children, and uh, there's a lot of nice, interesting books. There's one book, uh, oh, what's the name of that book? It's written by Richard Bandler, uh, The Prince and the Somebody. But it's, right, The Prince and the Frog. I mean, those are real nice uh, fairy tales, and even uh, Jungian has a lot of stuff. The Inner Guide Meditation, and that's a real nice book. It's written by a John Steinbrecher. And it is a meditation that uh, a person can do or take someone else through to help them identify their inner guide, okay? And so like all children can make, basically access this much better. And many times they talk about it, that they have friends and things, you know, but the a parents tell them to shut up and dismiss it and just a whole bunch of other things. But if you can help him access his inner guide 
where he basically will always have a means of being able to communicate and be able to be assisted in going into the inner worlds, then he won't lose the capacity. Okay. And so you can buy that book. It's called Inner Guide Meditation by John Steinbrecher. And The Prince and the Frog is very interesting because it does talk about how the brain works relative to the conscious mind, etc. Okay. Also, too, you know, really protecting their diet is very important because, you know, I did not allow my kids to uh, go to uh, public schools, and that was not my intention because I was really interested in them being able to go because um, the children that I grew up with whose parents supposedly were lawyers and doctors and that kind of stuff were really worthless as far as I'm concerned. So I was not really interested in my kids reading uh, a bourgeoisie life, etc. But in the city of Detroit, the public school system was just so outrageously dysfunctional that it would just be outrageous insult to just waste my kids' intelligence. So I had to send them to a, um, a, a private school. But the school that I selected, you know, was really pioneering for us was the school started by the sister, uh, Carmen and Omdi, where uh, she believed that the children do best when they are taught that they are the norm and then everything else that is not like them is identified as such so that they can be comfortable with it and see it as something unique outside of themselves but never be confused about the fact that there is a difference. Right. Yeah, right. And so when I introduced them to, so the, all of them went to that type of school, so therefore in that type of school, everything is always right brain, left brain. So, you know, there's three languages that are taught, Dancing is a requirement, swimming is a requirement, fine arts is a requirement, okay, mathematics is a requirement, computer science is a requirement. So everything is always balanced like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so therefore, you know, it's like those children are real interesting, real fantastic. So the requirements is that they uh, travel, they have to travel once a year, they have to have camp once a year. You know, they study herbs, the, the whole bit, you know. And so she's a, a real special woman that has done that. And what's so incredible was that her motivation for doing that required her um, one, two, yeah, to her third child's death, okay. Her um, third child uh, choked on her pacifier in her playpen, okay. But I think uh, Nataki was about nine months old, yeah. And so it was the, this child's death that motivated her to just go ahead on and just open the school, you know, because her thing was that, well, what do you do with this kind of energy? You know what I mean? So you don't become dysfunctional and, you know, you can't sit down and whine and cry about it, et cetera. So we might as well make, you know, her life have meaning in the lives of other children. And so what she had wanted to do always was to open this kind of school. And so that was her impetus. So see, it's always like understanding universal law and how it works, that all of these experiences, when you understand our stepping stones, okay, and you go ahead and step instead of freeze, you know, or fall down, okay, always takes you into a realm of a higher existence. And so all of these things actually always become a blessing, okay, not a scourge, you know, or not some terrible plague and whatever else. And so, you know, Carmen will tell you that, you know, this is the greatest thing that her daughter has ever been able to do, okay, is to actually be able to offer a quality of life for all these other children, okay, to be themselves anywhere in the world and still be able to be with Europeans or whoever and to be able to appreciate their uniqueness and their culture but never relinquish their own, okay? And uh, the same thing with my cancer. You know, it was like truly if I did not have had, you know, that type of cancer the lung, I wouldn't be standing here. You know, so it was one of my greatest teachers to recognize that, you know, who I am and what I am is all that I am and I need to make the best out of it. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? And actually use those powers that I have. And so for people to allow themselves to be saddled with um, maladies and dysfunctions, you know, and just wallow in it you know, or just accept it as something they're just going to carry with them or whatever, uh, miss the whole point because it is an initiation. And when you understand that that's all it is and basically go for it and master it, it's like you're never the same person, totally transformed and really invincible. Okay, so I think the greatest thing that I received from um, 
moving through that initiation was the fact that it, it's given me immunity to all other diseases because now I understand my own MO and what I need to do to impair and make myself sick. Okay, and when I don't surrender to that anymore, I don't care what you have. Okay, I mean, it's your problem, it's not mine. I mean, so your AIDS virus is yours, and your Legionnaire's disease is yours, and your herpes is yours, and whatever else. It cannot have any merit in this body because my internal chemistry does not harbor any type of imbalance that would nourish that. You understand what I'm saying? So, I mean, I don't have to worry about if I hug you, do you have AIDS? It's not my problem. Okay, so I mean, when people are, you know, clenching and running around here about, oh my God, who has AIDS and I can't do this, and I, yeah. I mean, you know, they're going to have all of that and more. Okay, because they're not understanding that health is a state of consciousness. And when you're truly healthy and in balance, etc., none of this stuff can harbor in your body because just your whole neurochemistry will not allow it. So, you know, I was looking at the, the plagues and things that came out of Europe, etc., and it always fascinated me about the people who had all the pus and things dripping on them because they were busy caring for the people they loved. It was the ones dragging the bodies out, throwing them on the wagons to be burned, and they never got sick. You know what I mean? And I was like, well, why is that? They inhaling all this stuff and it's dripping all over whatever else, you know, and they just dragging out more bodies, setting them on fire. They're not the ones falling down on the ground and the ones that living such a clean life and, you know, can't touch this and I can't do that. And every time you look up, they had a handkerchief to their mouth and the first ones to fall down on the ground. And it's like, well, what, what is it? Obviously, it is not exposure that's the issue, okay? It is basically, first of all, your internal chemistry that would nourish that. And fear seems to be the key formula. So that wherever there was fear, and we have identified that now, that fear chemically totally immobilizes the immune system. Totally impairs all functioning of red blood cells, T cells, B cells, lymphocytes. So now you want to get a disease, just first of all decide you're afraid of it. You got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, so you know, we, we're going to have to stop letting people trip us out. And even Pat Steer, on his deathbed, in his memoirs, his writing said that the environment is everything, the bacteria is nothing. And so therefore, when these drug companies keep pushing out and yanking out all these antibiotics and things, that they're tripping. You know, because the key here is the environment. And any bacteriologist or any lab technician knows that bacteria just don't grow anywhere on anything. You don't streak it out on the proper culture plate, it ain't growing. Don't mean it ain't there, it just means that you're not going to capture it because you're not giving it what it needs to manifest itself. So then what does that mean? That means that anytime you got infection, there's been a particular chemistry that you created that nurtures that. So all we have to do is just change the chemistry. So yes, you can do that with an antibiotic, but you can also do it with state of consciousness. And when you do a state of consciousness, you're not bound to the pharmacy, nor do you have to deal with the idiosyncratic reaction of the antibiotics. Well, you know. Yeah. Right. They're going to take out many more. I understand the first of the year, now, I just thought it was going to be a I'm not sure it is. It may no better than I know. But they plan on, if you need a vitamin on Earth, you have to go to your doctor and get a prescription. Right? Yeah, that's right. Well, look, if they don't know nothing about the science, how can they write yeah. a prescription on something you don't even understand? That's right. <laughs> so you have to understand then that if we do not have physicians or somebody that's willing to start teaching them, then that's going to be a whole form of self-therapy that you're going to lose. So how do you well, you need to go to your physician and tell them that they need to herb and get some information on minerals and vitamins and some herbs so you can continue having what you want.
Yeah, but who cares about the insurance company? Because abundance is the national state of affairs. So you can only have as much money as your consciousness will allow you to have. So, uh, so I mean, what does the insurance have to come in and do with this? Your cash is based on your consciousness. So if you want money, then you basically manifest it and pay for your minerals and vitamins. What does an insurance company come in this for? And see, this is why I'm saying that people are tripping because they are sitting up here missing the whole essence of who they are. And you, you want, if there's no insurance company, buy a car, but I see you can manifest the money to get that. So if you want some minerals and vitamins, then come up with the cash to pay for them. I mean, forget the insurance companies. Are they supposed to be able to keep you from the quality of health you want? Of course not. So you have to understand that now this is actually a real interesting network that can be created, which is what I'm very excited about because, you know, there are hundreds of other doctors like myself. Okay, the key of it is, is that now, you know, if we are smart as physicians, okay, we will basically really come together and network ourselves so that we can share this with many more physicians who are willing to do, uh, to go back to school really to learn this so that the patients can have what they need. But you have to understand now that they've already warned us as physicians that if we do decide to continue to dispense herbs and vitamins, as physicians that we will be laden with paperwork, as they put it, and that we are subject to electronic surveillance. That's just what they put, quote unquote. But see, my thing is, is that, well, you know, this is a healing for the physician. Because now, if you think that you're not already electronic surveillance, you're fooled, first of all. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Many times I've picked up a phone and there's all kind of folks on it, especially if you're using the portable phone. You can pick up all kind of things on that. So if you think that you're not already being electronic surveillance, you're a fool, you're missing the point. You understand what I'm saying? And obviously there's not enough papers that they can generate that you can't pay somebody to fill out. That's what, they got these big buildings of Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're just full of bodies filling out forms. So my thing is, is that, you know, these are not problems if you understand that you have infinite capacity to function with them. You understand what I'm saying? So this is actually a healing, as far as I'm concerned, to weed out the uh, hiding under the uh, profession of physicians that really are not worthy of being actually even able to be in that arena. And there's unfortunately too many of them. Okay, so I'm just saying that those physicians who are really interested will find that they basically, that's not an issue, and the patients that love themselves enough will basically manifest the cash for them to be able to have what they need. So if you can pay $50 for jeans, they know insurance company paying for that, right. then there's no question that you can't come up with some money for your vitamins for you to have a behind to put in those jeans. <laughs> that's it. And I don't deal with the insurance company. That's just it. And I had to stop, and see, and I hear you, but I had to stop dealing with insurances a very, very long time ago because that was a way that they actually used to put the physicians if you allow yourself to get into that. And so my thing is that you're not going to determine how much money I make, and you're not going to hold up my claim and tell me that they had edited an audit for 60 days or four, five months, which is what they tried to do. It's like, oh, well, for whatever reason, oh, we're, we're, we're holding $10,000 of your money in audit. So you sitting up here with a payroll and folks is like, uh, I got kids, can I get paid today? <laughs> and you're going to let somebody basically, you know, mess you, mess you up like that? No, not me. My thing is that we just moved to cash. <laughs> okay. No, we just moved to cash. <laughs> and you just basically pay for your services just like you would go into the store and buy blue jeans. It's no different. Or get your hair done. I mean, you go in there and buy food, you pay for it. You know, and my thing is, is that, you know, I am not going to allow what I do and who you are to be handled like, you know, it's some optional commodity on the shelf. So now everybody else can, you know, say that this stuff is important enough to demand cash and whatever, and you can pay for that, and then I can't ask you to pay cash for the very thing that allows you to have all this other stuff? No. So my thing is that the insurance company can't run my practice. Okay, I run this. Okay, and so therefore we just basically move to cash and they can take the money and the paper and stick it up their butt, whatever they want to do with it. And I'm really serious because it really gets into that, you know, and it's really interesting because, see, I, I had always wanted to do nothing but practice medicine. I was very idyllic in this. 
And when I kept being snatched down to have to deal with the business aspect of this and having to deal with all this other stuff, it was very irritating. But see, I truly now respect the universe for beating me down, okay, and loading me up with some business sense, okay, of understanding what was going to have to be really asked of me to be able to survive the times. Because the way that they are basically levying all this stuff, if you really do not pay attention and understand that you always have a choice and that people respond to you based on your consciousness, okay, because this is what we're always really marketing, that they, these institutions who are really not in the best interest of working with people will always be able to corral you into doing stuff that you really don't want to do, which you are going to be held responsible for. And that's like I said, is that I vowed to myself that once I was able to come from under cancer, I could not continue to allow myself to be pushed around based on somebody else's standards and belief systems. I had to just really call my own shot. So the key is that you can still have your minerals and vitamins, and I would recommend that you begin to identify the sisters and brothers who have uh, credentials to want to basically come together and uh, make those things available to you. Okay, and there's a lot of companies, as I said earlier, that are basically in the wings that have already set this up, because this has been going on to this kind of setup for a very, very long time. And if you really want to know something that's really interesting, you have to understand that these are the same maneuvers that Hitler used in World War II. Now, I thought that was real interesting. So if it's really true that history repeats itself, as I continue to look at what was happening in Rome before it fell, and what was actually happening in Germany before and during World War II, it's really interesting a whole bunch of this stuff is, real go is really going on. So the key is that you can make your own conclusions about where it's going, but you have to make some decisions about where you're going to be involved in it. Oh, no, 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 see, I'm not a victim of anything. <laughs> So, yeah, but see, the key of it is being exposed to something and being a victim of it is two different things. Okay, and so, yes, yeah, I've been exposed to a lot of stuff, but whether I'm victimized by it or not, no, not me. And it's very important that you get very clear about your internal talk to yourself, okay, because it really begins to actually immobilize certain reactions and functions in your body, and this is what I've been talking about all day. So yes, in our environment, we're exposed to some real interesting things. But now, how are we going to deal with it? Okay, and the greatest thing that you have going for you, especially as a, a melanin-dominant individual, is that if you can manage to basically keep your melanin clean and your melanin activated and really are willing to live a purposeful life, then you basically are already overcome it. It will basically just yes, teach you how to basically keep your melanin clean. Now, as far as getting on purpose and living a purposeful life, no, it won't. There's some other things that you have to do, you know. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, the brothers who have the capacity and the knowledge and understand what I'm talking about will be willing to compliment the sisters and begin to form support groups. Okay, where the brothers can begin to start dealing with their issues and learning universal laws to govern themselves by so that we all come out at the same point of evolution. How we've done this in Detroit is that our men meet just like the women do uh, every week, once a week for an hour and a half, and then the last weekend of the month, then we come together and we deal with our issues. Okay, and I mean, and we're very open and honest about this because we've dealt with issues on fornication, child abuse, just a whole bunch of other things. And it's been interesting. I, I think one of the most interesting topics that the brothers came and posed to the sisters was the fact that the brothers asked, why don't um, women trust them around their young daughters? Okay, see, that's, that's a real big issue. You know, just like we asked them, you know, how does a two-year-old child become a sex object? Okay, can you explain that to us? Okay, so, you know, the, the key is that we don't try to guess and surmise and, you know, uh, make rationalizations anymore. We just ask you what the issue is. I mean, can you tell me how you have sex with a two-year-old as a man? I want to know that. And don't tell me you don't do it because they wind up in the hospital too frequently ruptured because you've done this. So don't even trip on that. So it looks like it's accountability. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. When the brothers say, yeah, we know that you don't like us around our young daughters. I mean, and it's true. Because there's too many women that even come to my face and say, well, after my husband died or I separated, I had two young daughters. I wasn't getting married anymore until they were up and out of the house. 
Okay, so now they're screwed up because they have no reference of how you grow up with a man, how you have a relationship as a husband, etc. So they're trying to figure out what to do with this man because they never had one around because the mother not understanding that you have to basically have exposure to be able to master this. It just this doesn't happen like this. Now they're not capable of having marriages because they don't even know how to treat a man. They don't know what they do, how they act, whatever. No reference at all because she, in her own fear, is thinking she's protecting them from whatever she experienced or her grandmother told her might happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we got to look at all this stuff. So these support groups are to basically bring all this to the forefront and to deal with all of this, these issues, etc., so that we do not continue to try to hide and suppress it with drugs and alcohol or, you know, promiscuity or whatever else, all of this stuff is being repressed is actually manifesting as. So I basically uh, definitely am oriented right now to organizing women's issues and women's support groups. And again, I do put it out there that the brothers who do understand what I'm talking about and are willing to learn and to help other brothers learn universal laws really need to be compatible with that and to structure their own support groups to deal with these issues. Thank you. Yes, and that talks about in the book because uh, synthetic fibers interfere with the complete light spectrum that goes through the clothing. And see, melanin is so interesting, you know, it's like your whole body is an eye. Okay, so it's like when you put on these synthetic fibers, etc., it's like putting a patch over your eye. Okay, so it actually causes a neurologic retardation. You know, it's like really interesting. So, you know, natural fibers are very important for us, okay, because it does not interfere with the full light spectrum being able to penetrate and be, and hit the skin, okay. So polyester is something that's very, very dangerous for us. So your, your natural fibers are, you know, rainy, linen, cotton, rayon, okay, silk, you know, all of those different things. And it's interesting because you'll find that the more natural fibers you wear, you know, your wardrobe actually becomes all year round. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, wool is okay, but I, I have found that, um, hmm, it's really something. I don't like wool too much anymore. I don't know what it is about it. But uh, I find that I just don't really do well with wool. I just rather uh, wear heavy silk for other reasons. They seem to breathe better for me. Okay, but you know, you have to kind of feel your own uh, stuff around, but you definitely want to make sure that it is definitely 100% cotton, okay, or 100% fiber, whatever it is, okay? Okay, yes ma'am. Oh. Okay, say that again. You said the last thing was what on my Badia tape was? Okay, right. Okay, I'll answer that uh, retrograde here, okay. Uh, first of all, I had talked about that last night, as those of you who came to Afria, that uh, one of the serious problems that we have as to why drug addiction has such a high recidivism rate for us is the fact that right now, to my knowledge, there are very few drug rehab programs that honor the melanation of the individual that they're treating which means that because melanin is something that just does not color our, hand, our hair and our skin and uh, our eyes, that it actually is in 12 sites of our brain, it's throughout our muscle mass, it's actually throughout our bloodstream, etc., that this means that this is something that has to be reckoned with. And the street drugs that are on the street have parts of or actually contain the entire parent molecule of melanin. So that these drugs actually bind with the melanin, okay, because the melanin identifies them as itself because the similarities are so great. So therefore melanin is not going to just release this off of itself unless it has a substitute that is more receptive. So that means then that these drugs actually now become part of us. And it's really just by sheer willpower 
that these people continuously combat this urge of actually wanting to just take this into themselves again. So not unless the person is physically detoxed of the drug, that is that the drug component is actually broken off of the melanin molecule, are they actually really free from the drug. And I think it's interesting that all of these drugs are actually like this. So uh, the drug rehab program has to be able to offer substances to the patient to replace the drug molecule so off of the melanin, okay? Because if you give melanin the real polymers of itself, or so I say the components of itself, it will basically break off the cousins, as we call it, or those that are simulated like itself and take on the real thing. But if you don't give it to it, it just holds on that that seems to basically be similar to itself. So there are two products on the market, the Pro Melanin 2000, and also the Sun Life foods that are able to do that. But also there's just a certain diet that helps to do that. And one of the worst things that these individuals can have are other drugs in the form of caffeine, nicotine, and white sugar. And it's a joke that when you talk about basically de rehabbing these people and you got a coffee machine sitting up there and a pot machine sitting up there and a machine full of candy bars. I mean, that's totally ridiculous because part of the basic polymer of melanin is the B vitamin. Riboflavin, okay, thymine, et cetera, are primary melanin. They are pigments that actually vibrate actually in the orange yellow spectrum. They are basically primary pigments and are important, important polymers, or should I say copolymers, on the melanin molecule. And the first thing that uses those up is sugars. Okay, for you to metabolize sugars, that's the first thing you're going to use up is your B vitamins. So therefore, every time you gobble that stuff up, there's definitely going to actually uh, relinquish the melanin molecule of having that to be able to renew itself. So it has to be actually also for us brought down to a physical level, our detox program. And none of these programs that are offered to us basically entertain that at all. So, you know, to go up to, as I say, my expression is to go to the Betty Ford Drug Rehab Center does not work for us because we cannot detoxify ourselves in two weeks. Europeans can because they don't have much melanin. But we cannot do that. So the drug runs out of their system. It does not do that with us. How does alcohol play into that same phenomenon? It's the same problem, and especially because it uh, deals with what we call the primary melanins of the B vitamin chain. It's a real, real issue here, okay? It's a real issue, and so even in the withdrawal phase and detoxification from alcohol, which you know can be lethal if it's not handled properly, and you know that these people need high amounts of B vitamins, we need two or three times as much because of the amount of melanin that we have that uses that as part of itself. Okay, so I mean just the whole thing is actually not even constructed to just deal with our own physiology. Now she talked about the Medea effect and I have some tapes on that in a little booklet and it was very interesting because I was reading um, in a Scientific America magazine about the Medea genes. These Medea genes are genes that they have found that are in every living organism that will bring about the auto-destruction of the organism if activated. Now, I thought that was fascinating. I'm like, wow, you mean tell me we have an iron destruct button? I mean, we're all born with one? I was like, woo, that's heavy, you know? So they were talking about the fact that these genes actually are passed on to the offspring by the mother and by the father. However, whether the mother's auto destruct mechanism is already turned on when she conceives determines whether the baby is born with their auto destruct mechanism turned on, not the father. So that's why they happen to have thought it was a pun that these were the Medea genes because Medea, which is a Greek goddess who was married to Jason the Argonaut, as you know, killed all of her children in a rage of jealousy. And so it is the woman that passes down the gene as to whether it will be turned on or not, not the man. And so these Medea genes also have the capacity to make their own antidote. So they can be turned off so that the auto-destruct mechanism is interrupted. So what these genes do is that when they're activated, they totally take over the functioning of the cell, and based on what they contain in their own genetic makeup determines what the functioning of the cell is going to be, which is not part of what the normal mechanism is to sustain the whole, which is why they 
actually kill you. So it's so interesting because as I thought about this phenomena, what I began to identify was the fact that the diseases that we have now of a chronic nature are all symptoms of the Medea effect. So if you have cancer, if you have MS, if you have hypertension, if you have sarcoidosis, if you have all this stuff, what you're really seeing is your auto-destruct mechanism turned on and in action. Mm -hmm. And so the key here is that, you know, how the symptom is manifesting is really not important. It's important to get you to understand that you're in an auto-destruct mode and you need to make some serious decisions about what you want to do so that you can then actually be on a program, more so in focusing your consciousness, so that you can actually turn this off. And so it's very interesting because when you read about these people who have overcome these supposedly chronic diseases that are going to terminate in death, and what they really had to do to be able to interrupt the process, it all goes back to them taking control of their lives, making decisions about who it is they are and what they want to be, and then doing it. It has nothing to do with the medicine that they took and the surgery they had. And that's what's so phenomenal because that's what they talk about in the book. I was cut to the hilt, poisoned to the hilt with chemotherapy, irradiated until my skin fell off, and I was still dying. So when I decided to do X, Y, and Z, then that's when it all stopped. Okay, because all of these chronic diseases are symptoms of an auto-destruct mechanism because we are still playing games with universal law. And they're not going to be able to have resolution in a pharmaceutical lab. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, it's been recently brought to light that homosexuality is a disease. Is that true? Is that something you're trying to feed us? I mean, that's such an interesting phenomenon, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, I have really asked for enlightenment on that one, okay, because, I mean, that is just such a phenomenal interaction, you know. And see, I, all I can tell you is this, okay, because the truth that has come down to me so far on this whole issue is that it is a reflection of an individual who has refused to want to honor their obligation to master self. Okay, because as I said, in other dimensions, there's no such thing as gender. Okay, and if you've had our body experiences, et cetera, you know you don't experience yourself as male or female, your consciousness. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So that means that if that's the case, then why am I down here in a female body, or why is, you know, somebody else down here in a male body? Well, I begin to actually look at my own perception of myself, okay? And it's interesting because I have had recollections of past lives for myself, okay? And there's been very few of them that I was actually a uh, female, okay? That most of my past lives, I was definitely a man, okay, as far as gender here on Earth. So it's like, hmm, that's like really interesting. So how did I get to be female and extremely female as far as I'm concerned? Okay. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I mean, let's look at your personality, you know, your directness and, you know, the fire that's Okay. For you to actually know the creator in total entirety, be able to use left and right brain, etc., what would be the most ideal circumstance for you to have to really master that aspect of yourself and become aware of it? And obviously it wouldn't be to continue to incarnate in a male body. Okay, that I would actually have to come here now as the magnetic or reciprocating aspect of myself and work life through that perception. Okay, and I was like, oh, okay. So then if you're telling me that this uh, gender issue is an opportunity for me to actually learn more about and to master myself, especially from an opposite polarity, well, it's like, okay, fine. So then it means that my commitment then in incarnating in this body is to master everything that the feminine principle embodies, right? So that means being able to deal with men and have children and do all these other things, et cetera, if that's within the realm of my purpose. Okay, so I'm like, oh, okay, fine. So I have the body, so I made this commitment. So now the school that I went to, medical school, was extremely interesting because it was one of the first schools that began to do transsexual surgery. Okay, so that was like really interesting because when you think of, you know, Omaha, Nebraska, the middle of the state, you know, they are truly, you know, into, you know, all American values and turkey at Thanksgiving and that kind of stuff. And they're down here actually ch changing folks' sex 
is really uh, far out, you know what I mean? But I mean, they, they have a whole big section that they basically are into basically doing transsexual surgery, some of the pioneers in that. So it was like really interesting having to deal with this whole, we had a whole unit on sexuality that we had to deal with because they were really known for this. And so it was interesting sitting here, you know, talking to these people who were talking about, you know, they made a mistake and I'm not a woman, I'm really a man, you know, and so therefore I got to get my body corrected and, you know, I'm a man, not a woman, so we got to, you know, get myself straightened out and all these different things. I mean, it was like incredible, you know, and to them in their own mindset, they're like, well, you know, I tried to be married as a woman and I, you know, had kids and all that stuff it was just totally ridiculous, but I'm really a man, so, you know, get the breast off, please. You know what I mean? And, I mean, seriously, because they did the whole thing. So, you know, the men psychologically who were in women's bodies, I mean, they had mastectomies, they had the whole bit that were done. So they took the testosterone shots, they went through the whole psychotherapy, the whole bit. It was like incredible when you saw the before and after. So the men, the men who basically said, no, I'm a woman, it's ridiculous, get this thing from off of my legs, and, you know, just the whole bit, and, you know, and it was, like, incredible. So, you know, they got the whole estrogen stuff and, you know, got their hairs all electrolyzed away, and, you know, they had implants dropped in, and they had vaginas made, and they had penises cut off, and, you know, they just took whole lessons on how to walk in pantyhose and the whole bit. I mean, it's always, like, really interesting. <laughs> So it was like I forgot one day that we were still doing our sexual unit, you know, and so I got to class late, but they hadn't started yet, this panel, and I forgot all about that. So, you know, as I was sitting there and I was, you know, they had uh, two men and two women that had been, uh, had transsexual surgery. So there were two men and two women, but they were like not men and not women, okay, if that's what makes sense to you. And it was like really interesting because, you know, these were like, and you know, usually you can tell them because they're like ultra, ultra women, you know, so they had real big, huge bouffant hairstyles and all these curls and all this makeup and all these eyelashes and, you know, at that time they were like wearing mini skirts and little go-go boots, so I mean, they had all that on and all this stuff, you know. So I'm like, oh, this is real interesting. I was like thinking maybe this is some doctor's wives or doctor's husbands or whatever, you know. <laughs> that was going to tell us something or whatever. And it was just so interesting because um, when one of the ladies started talking, you know, I mean, and see, the, and the voice in men can never change. Whatever this phenomenon is, that once testosterone goes to the bloodstream and the vocal cords coarsen, you know, I don't care how much estrogen you take, that never, ever uh, becomes soft again. Okay, and so as ultra-feminine as this man looked, Okay, I mean, there's no way at all, I mean, his whole epiglottis, all this was all taken care of. I mean, this was just all silk and smooth, you know. And I met, when that man started talking, and with that baritone voice, and you're looking at these little white go-go boots and this little skirt on, and all these boots on hair, I just couldn't believe it. I almost fell out the chair. I just thought that was just the most craziest thing I had ever seen. You know, and I mean, he's minding his gay, you know, some that's like this, you know, some, you know, and I was like, wow, I mean, this is like really, really crazy. I mean, it's really weird stuff, you know, and when one of the men in the process of healing over his surgery, he forgot and went to the bathroom and sat down on the toilet and, you know, they have to put these obturators in. Because once they, you know, you have two parts of the penis, the bobo cavernosis and spongiosis, okay, and they take one out with the blood vessels that make the erection, and the other one that uh, has all the sensory nerves, they actually cut out the space that has this fat in it, and they turn it inside and sew it in, and they have to put an obturator in there to hold it in so that it gets blood supply and it doesn't die, okay? So it's a real important part of the surgery, right? And so, therefore, if they don't have the obturator in, the skin will actually macerate on itself, and then the whole thing will rot. It's just a big, ugly thing, and the whole thing is a flop, okay? So you've got to keep the skin separate, and you've got to keep it up against the wall so that it revascularizes, okay? And he went to the bathroom, and he forgot, and the obturator fell out and broke because it's glass. And you have never seen anybody in a panic before in your life. I mean, so he was in here, we were in the clinic one day, you know, and of course I'm up in the GYN clinic, right? These are all women, and then this, <laughs> you know, he comes in and like, he's like 6'2", you know, and he's talking about my name is not needed and I need some help on my operation, you know, and I'm like, whoa, what is the world? You know, 
know, and I was like, wow, this is like really interesting, you know. So the staff man was, uh, of course, he recognized him because he did the surgery, you know, so he was like, okay. So I mean, it was like really so strange to put this man up in the stirrups and everything, you know, and to just... <laughs> I mean, it was like so weird because in the stirrups, his foot was like this, you know, he had these big goatee feet, you know, and he had these huge hands and everything. And he was talking about his name was Lanita, you know, and I'm like, whoa, I mean, this is incredible. So he told me he was getting ready to get married soon and he and his fiance and the whole bit, you know, but the point being is, just try to answer your question, just like I said, it's like, it's like really uh, an interesting phenomenon. All I can say is, is that, you know, what is coming to me right now is that it is an abdication of these individuals who actually want to experience this whole aspect of themselves. The familiarity that they might have been because they've been women so many past lifetimes and they've gotten so ultra extreme that now they're being asked to be a man to bring themselves into balance and it's like just totally, I don't want to deal with it. You know what I mean? I'm just used to being over here and, you know, getting my hair fluffed and my nails done and whatever else, and I'm not even interested in this and this is gross. I mean, I could actually see that in my own mind when I actually look at myself. But see, the commitment is that you come here with all the tools that you need and you're supposed to use them all. There's no mistake. Okay? And so, you know, even when you look at the energetics of it, I mean, it just short circuits you out energetically and everything. You know, so um, I still feel that I need some more enlightenment information on this, you know, and uh, I would really like to do that, but I, I, uh, I'm really concerned about someone addressing that whole issue in relationship to universal law, okay? Because see, there is no such thing as a mistake, and you know, obviously there is a need for the individuals to experience everything that this particular lifestyle has to offer, and the um, perception that this is not something that you care to do is really uh, a, a reneging on the whole thing. And it's so interesting when women especially still want to have children. You know, because I was reading the whole thing, yeah, since this woman, her children were taken away from her. Her little boy was taken away from her because in the state of Virginia, you know, the, it's looked at as sodomy. And so they, she was like an unfit mother, so they took her son away from her. And uh, they were just talking about all the other uh, lesbian couples that actually have decided to have children, you know, and so they actually have friends that donate sperm, or even they go to a sperm bank and they're artificially inseminated. And I'm like, you know, that is crazy. Okay, I mean, because that automatically admits to you, it should, okay, that for you to actualize your whole capacity as functioning as a woman, et cetera, that you have to deal with male energy. I mean, that's the whole thing is whether, you know, it's a penis that inseminates you, you know, or whether it's a, a special sperm cup that we have. I mean, the whole point is it's the same phenomenon. And to think that you can get around not interacting with that opposite energy is just an illusion. I mean, it's like, as far as I'm concerned, what I'm seeing when I really uh, listen to some of these women is very deep-seated fear. Okay, usually most of them come with a imprinting of just some poor relationships that they've had either with, you know, uh, the opposite sex or some other things that, you know, they have to just, just totally shut down on. Okay, but it uh, is not a natural thing. I'm even looking at questioning, yeah, what do the children do? Because they were talking about the fact that, you know, so many of these uh, couples are trying to raise children. And it's a real interesting situation because the people who now think that they are so balanced who are heterosexual, so many of them are so selfish, you know, they're not interested in having kids themselves, let's not adopting somebody else's. So we have people, okay, we have people who uh, definitely uh, need family, okay, and then we have people who have the, at least financial wherewithal to take care of them, but it's like their whole social lifestyle, I mean, what is this going to create with the kids? So again, this is the whole question that each and every one of us has to ask ourselves, how we feel about this, what do we really want to do about it, and we can't just continuously sit by and do absolutely nothing. You know, these are whole social issues that each and every one of us has to deal with because these individuals are going to be growing up amongst us, okay, and they are going to have definitely some effect upon our lives. You know, and I think that trials, and just my opinion too, with these two uh, sons that killed their parents. 
Okay, my thing is, is that, you know, well, how many teachers really knew that the younger brother was being sexually molested and didn't say anything? Okay, or the neighbors next door heard him hollering and screaming when they was getting beat up and didn't say anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the attitude is, it's none of my business, or uh, yeah, 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 I don't know anything. And so now, when they, for whatever reason, blow their heads off, now everybody's sitting up here talking about how terrible. But, I mean, there were signs and symptoms that were exhibited in the community that there was something that was not right, and nobody said anything and did anything. You know, and I continuously see this on the street. You know, I've just seen stuff that's just been altercations. I mean, men and women have an altercation. I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, I mean, this man is like just busting this woman's face off. And like, we're not supposed to say anything. We're supposed to wait for the police so that when she's dead and in respiratory distress, now we're supposed to do something. And my thing is like, give me a break. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, please, do you mind? I mean, you just cannot continue to sit up here and hit the sister like this in front of my face. I mean, this, this is going to have to stop. And we just have to do something about this. You know, and it's really interesting. My experiences have not been that now they basically want to beat me up either because these people usually that do this are just really so shocked that anybody would even check them on their stuff because they just used to just go anywhere and doing any old kind of thing. You know, I mean, I've seen kids stealing stuff and it's like, where are you going with this except to the cash register to pay for it? <laughs> you know? Now, a person that have never had anybody curse me out and call me a bunch of names and tell me anything. Except that they look stupid and drop it if they're not going to pay for it. But I'm like, you know, I mean, we cannot continue to be in these environments and see the stuff and lend a blind eye. You know what I'm saying? Because it really has far-reaching consequences on our whole families when we don't do this. I think about perhaps how many of our kids have been killed in these schools and things that we knew there were problems with these folks that killed them up and didn't say nothing or talk to their parents. So it's like what we all do has an effect on one another and we need to really be aware of that. Now I'm told that I must be quiet and I do <laughs> want to just share with you um, Barbara O, this is my dear, dear friend, she's such a wonderful person, and I hope that all of you have thought about and have already applied to go to her retreat next week. So it's on the 22nd of September at Cottonwood, Alabama. I've had the privilege of being there with the Bronner family and uh, having given some lectures there, and it's just been a wonderful place. It's a very wonderful healing spa, and the waters are wonderful. But I'll tell you a secret, make sure you get up early in the morning and get in the waters. Don't get in there at night. Okay, it's like the cocoon effect. <laughs> Does everybody know the cocoon effect? Right. So by the time everybody's gotten in there throughout the day, the energies are gone at night. <laughs> so the energies, for whatever reason, in that area start rising at sunrise in the waters. And so if you get up early at sunrise and get in the waters, it just really sets you up for the whole day from the spring. Okay? Uh, let's see. Now, this says here there are two more openings for consultations with me on Sunday afternoon. So those individuals who think that they need a private consultation with me, you're welcome to occupy those spaces. Our women's support group is going to be meeting here tomorrow morning at 9.30. That's at the University City Science Center at 3624 Market Street. Okay? And also it has written on here that there is missing a set of keys on the back table. Did somebody inadvertently? Oh, okay. Good. All right, so it says, Dear Jewel, Dear Dr. Jewel, we need to close. Give thanks. <laughs> and one more question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that it? Okay, you want to close. Okay. All right. <laughs> 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 Thank you. We'll be on trip and we'll be well. <laughs> right. Good. And we will bring her back. <laughs>